So we want to just jump right into it here, and we want to start off our conversation by discussing the shackles of debt that have been holding down the African continent for decades. And we are very honored to be joined as we continue the show by Grief Shelwell, who is the Director of Research at the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School. Grief, thank you so much for being with us here on the show. Uh, Eugene and Rania, thanks for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Well, the pleasure is really all ours. And, you know, recently you worked uh, on a fantastic dossier, I have to say, from the Tricontinental uh, Institute for Social Research about exactly this issue uh, of African debt. And I was hoping to start, you could maybe just sort of set the frame for us a little bit, because one of the things I thought was most interesting in the report is, you know, whether we're talking about the rise of the IMF debt regimes uh, in the mid 1970s uh, or the rise of the huge explosion of private debt in the early part of this century. Century, it seems like this is not just sort of a, a, a neutral reality that was set forward, but that the debt mechanisms are designed to institutionalize a certain global power structure. So I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about that. Uh, you're right, Eugene. I think debt as a mechanism of control, I think, is the way you've, you've put it. And uh, it's worth uh, for your listeners and viewers to sort of understand why is it that the African continent uh, in many ways, seems to be addicted to debt. It looks like it's addicted to debt. But I think it's important to understand that history has gotten us to this point, right? So the history of colonialism, the history of imperialism, the history, the current uh, uh, moments of neocolonialism have gotten us into this kind of situation where many of our countries are always lacking in the su sufficient capital to do what they need to do, right? So, uh, you know, you know, Countries need to put up infrastructure, we need to invest in hospitals, schools, roads, electricity, the kind of stuff that's really important and a precondition for development. But we do not have sufficient capital internally. Why is it that we don't have sufficient capital internally? Because a lot of our capital is spirited away to the West, right? So we then find ourselves in this kind of situation where we are capital deficient, and because we're capital deficient, we then have to borrow. Uh, not unlike the situation of like a, a low low wage worker who is exploited and extracted and they have no choice but to go to a payday lender, as is the case in the US, right? Mm. So this is similar to what uh, to the African situation. And because of that, we go through these cycles of debt. And that debt, like you were saying, Eugene, is used as a mechanism of control. It's a mechanism of subordination and all those kinds of things. And it's interesting, you know, this is happening right now where you see this new sort of cycle of IMF going around the world, uh, advising countries in the global south, whether in Latin America or the Middle East or Africa or Asia, to institute even more austerity measures in a time when a lot of countries are suffering from the aftermath of COVID, for one. I mean, COVID destroyed, COVID destroyed a lot of economies. Uh, in ways that the Global South had a much more difficult time bouncing back from if it, it hasn't really done that, actually. And then, moreover, we have this war in Ukraine uh, that has, you know, led to shortages of certain items. I know, you know, I live in Lebanon, for example, and the country's cash strapped because of its own economic crisis on top of the fact that oil, fertilizer, prices of all of these raw commodities, you know, went like shot up. Uh, and so... Right now, it seems as though the IMF is going around to a lot of African countries and trying to pers you know, push for more austerity. Can you talk a little bit about what exactly the IMF is demanding right now and if it's any different than in the past? Uh, Rania, yeah, that's a good question. And I think, again, tying up to the question Eugene asked earlier, we have to understand. So essentially, the IMF, the World Bank, and other international financial institutions, particularly the IMF and the World Bank, when an idea that came out of the establishment of the United Nations, right? So when the United Nations was established right after Second World War, um, there was a thinking. And I think, I mean, it's a bit tricky to assess whether the United Nations has been a net good or not. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, I think it, for a while, the UN did play quite an important role. I think, for example, the movement to dec politically decolonize many, of, many countries in Africa, for example. I mean, that idea... Uh, was given quite some credence by the UN. Anyway, so the World Bank and the IMF came out of this settlement after Second World War. And the idea itself was a good idea. The idea was essentially to say, uh, look, we are always going to have crisis of one, one form or the other. And as brothers and sisters, 
we need to look out for each other. So we're going to establish two organizations, the World Bank to finance long-term development, and then the IMF to sort out short-term financial crises, like the one that Lebanon is going through or the one that many countries in the glo global south are going through. So a great idea on paper. Now, the sad thing is that this great idea on paper became captured by the US and Western Europe, right? It became geopoliticized. These two entities became tools of projecting Western power. And it, that's why it's no surprise that the IMF is headquartered in Washington, DC. The World Bank is headquartered in Washington, DC. The president of the World Bank is effectively picked by the president of the US and the managing director of the IMF is effectively picked by Europeans, right? So one has to understand this. Uh, and, and because of this, and because there's this you know, the West wants to maintain dominance, you know, economic dominance. It's useful um, for capitalism, for example, to have subservient countries to provide the raw materials that powers the engines in the in the center, in the core, in the metropole, right? So it, all this, when, when you think about all this stuff, it then makes sense to have austerity, right? For the, for the IMF to swoop in into a country in the global south, instead of saying you are in any, an, an economic crisis moment and you ought to be spending more, particularly on the poor, particularly on the working class, particularly on marginalized communities. That's what you ought to be doing. After all, that's what often happens in the West when there's an economic crisis. You don't do austerity, you do the reverse. But again, it all makes sense why the IMF comes over here and they say, cut spending, cut spending on health, education, and those kinds of things, precisely because we want to maintain you in a state of perpetual subservience. Right, so I, I, I hope this kind of, it was a roundabout way around you of answering your question, but I had to do that no, to no, get to this perfect. point. Yes. No, I, I, there's there's so many layers to it, and obviously there's so much obfuscation of it. You know, is uh, and I'm sure you've seen this. You know, the, the Kiel Institute in Germany has just released their new database on on African debt, and there's a range of things that it, it reveals. But one of the things I thought was interesting is they examine the rates of interest of the various types of loans, and of course, the the private loans were you know significantly higher than almost everything else coming from the bond market, and so on and so forth. And they were they were noting that you know some of the African countries have become so trapped in these debt cycles that they're taking out lower interest loans to pay off the higher interest loans. And it's just an unbelievable cycle so that almost nothing is really being paid towards the actual needs of the country to some degree. It just now becomes, a, as you said, like a payday lender sort of reality. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, you know, that aspect of, of how the various different types of lenders are, are, you know, who is out there, the IMF, there's China we hear a lot about, there's private uh, loans, but how those things sort of interact as well. Um, that's true. And I, I think, I mean, the core, there's a core fundamental issue, which is that a lot of countries in the global south, particularly in Africa, have a deficiency, a deficient in capital, kind of, you know, in sort of funds to fund these large scale development projects. Uh, Eugene, you can't develop without uh, sufficient electric power. You can't develop without laying out a road network, without a communications infrastructure. These things are incredibly critical. And many of these countries, again, were, built, were dealt a bad, uh, bad set of cards from colonialism because all that colonialism did was build infrastructure that supported the extraction of, of, of raw materials to feed the beast in the West, right? Uh, so a lot of these countries are trying to play catch up, right? And they're desperate for capital. The World Bank was supposed to be performing this role of supplying long-term capital at very low interest rates, at what they call concessional interest rates. But the World Bank, for geopolitical reasons, like I just uh, illustrated a short while ago, uh, two of you know Western power, doesn't want to do that. Because if the World Bank does its job properly, then a lot of these countries in the global south will be self-sustaining, they'll stand on their own, and then nobody can push them around. So because the World Bank hasn't been performing this role, right, a lot of loan sharks or shy locks or whatever you want to call them have popped out of the woodworks, mm. right? So it is not the case that the Zambian government, for example, chose to go borrow from private lenders at high interest rates. That wasn't a choice they made. <laughs> they were forced into doing that precisely because of the reasons that I've just given. Uh, and so that, that's what explains this sort of different profile of lenders, Right, it is a reaction or response to the fact that the inst the multilateral institutions that are supposed to coordinate all this for us in a brotherly and sisterly way, in a peaceable way, haven't been doing it, and therefore, you know, again, I like this analogy of payday lending. 
uh, folks don't go to pay their lenders because they want to. You know, they do it because they're shut out of the actual form of financial system, uh, either by, you know, either they have high credit scores as a route of racism, discrimination, all sorts of stuff. So I think that's important to illustrate uh, why we have this different profile of lenders. I also, you know, I wanted to ask because the, the arguments always made in the general consensus in the mainstream really around the world is that in order for these countries to do better economically and to deal with all this debt, they have to take out not only more loans, but they have to, again, institute all these austerity measures that keep them from, you know, developing properly. And so one of the things that I think is important is to talk about there are actual alternative ways <laughs> to deal with these sorts of things if these countries were allowed to and if it wasn't up to the US and the Europeans and these financial institutions like the IMF that they control. So can you talk about some of those alternatives? Yeah, you're right. And I think so the, the, the issues, the fundamental issues, is this deficiency of capital, right? So how are we going to get hold of this capital? How do we get this capital that we really need to power our own development? The first thing, for example, is transnational corporations or multinational, the big, big companies that operate across many borders, most of, most of whom are headquartered, I, I, don't, I can't even think of any exception, but many of them are headquartered in the West, make it incredibly difficult to be able to collect tax revenues. I mean, they just make it incredibly difficult, right? So what some countries in the global South are trying to do is to get together and figure out, is there a way we can work together to make sure that we can we can begin to tax these multinationals that extract lots of profit from our countries and then they, they put it away in tax havens, right? You know, in, 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 in sort of in tax havens. Is there now to, to be able to do that, you gotta work together. So like there's some experiments in Latin America, some Latin American countries are trying to get together, for example, to try and uh, and work together and find a mechanism of collecting some of this tax revenue, which will go a long way in closing this capital deficiency gap that I just spoke about. Another mechanism which countries are trying to ex experiment with in the, in the global South, particularly Latin America. Latin America is a very interesting place because they're very imaginative. They're very imaginative in trying to think about alternatives. So can we find a way of bypassing the US dollar? Because again, that's a problem. A lot of our debt is dollar denominated debt, which puts us at the mercy of the US Federal Reserve Bank, right? But can we find a mechanism of, of doing this, some of these transactions uh, by bypassing the dollar? So can we establish regional currency arrangements? For example, I think um, the new president of Brazil, the old, but then again, new president, he was there before, he's come back again, uh, has proposed this idea of the SU. I think it's S-U-R, right? A regional currency that can facilitate trade and finance. Right. So those are some some of the some of the many and, and other types of examples. Can we come up with alternative development banks, new types of development bank that can perform the role that the World Bank was meant to perform, but that they've neglected to do? I think you might have heard of the new development bank, a.k.a. BRICS Bank, that's headquartered in Shanghai, China, uh, whose uh, president, who the president of BRICS Bank is Dilma Rousseff former president of Brazil, and the new development bank has a simple mandate. They want to do development financing in a brotherly and sisterly way with very low interest rates for a very long maturity, very long term, and to finance infrastructure development in a way that facilitates development and doesn't trap this countries in cycles of debt. So Rania, those are some of the alternatives. And I think there are many that have been floating around and these things are not new. These things are not new. Many of our, those who've come before us have proposed them and so on and so forth. So there are many, many types of alternatives. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I wonder how you also evaluate this issue of, you know, the role China is playing. I mean, obviously in the G20 common framework debt mechanism, this has become the most controversial issue um, with the West essentially saying that they are refusing to address anything regarding Zambia's debt, Ethiopia's debt. Uh, I guess, you know, Chad, it's a little bit different, but whatever. They're essentially saying that they want China to be the first mover with the implication being that China is the biggest problem um, and thus, you know, the, the whole debt trap narrative. So I wonder how you evaluate that. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Eugene. And I mean, obviously, the truth is much more complex. And again, it's a game of geopolitical posturing that's going on, right? So uh, China is a rising power. Some people, the, the old powers are not very happy with this. There's a new kid on the block. Uh, 
So the new kid on the block is getting all the flat. That's essentially what's going on here. Uh, I mean, certainly China is not being uh, insincere because China is asking a couple of questions. For example, one of the most interesting thing about how we think about sovereign debt, Eugene and Rania, uh, is that multilateral development banks like the World Bank, for example, are required not to take required not to take a haircut. So they have also lent money. And they are saying, we want to get paid mm. for uh, 100 cents on the dollar. We want to get paid 100 cents on the dollar. We're not going to take a haircut in the case of Zambia. Somebody else should take a haircut. And maybe China should take a haircut. And understandably, China is saying, why should I take a haircut whilst you are refusing to, uh, to take a haircut, World Bank? After all, much of these problems have been created by you guys. So that's some of the dialogue and some of the deliberation, which kind of makes sense, right? Also, the hedge funds, the sort of US, Western European hedge funds, also have got a role to play in this. So they also say, we don't want to take a haircut. China should take a haircut because China caused this. But that's not, that's not really true. And I think one of the most interesting things, Eugene and Rania, is that when you do a survey on the African continent and you ask, say, the typical African and say, what's your view of China, right? And, and surveys have been done on this. Many, many people respond by saying, we're kind of favorable. And it makes sense. Why would they say this? Because they can, can kind of see the fruits of our interactions with China. If you come to many African capital cities, Eugene, you see that the infrastructure landscape has changed. You can see highways. You can see hospitals. You can see power stations. And then many are asking the question, oh, we've been dealing with the US for quite a while now. We've been dealing with Britain for quite a while now. But we've never really seen some, we've never seen this kind of tangible fruits of friendship, right? So I think this is what's going on here. And I think China is being blamed uh, when the truth is much more complex. And when China has really been trying to play ball, in the, in the era of COVID, for example, when COVID broke, China was one of the first countries, and I think one of the few countries, to suspend interest payments on debt that was owed to it, right? Yep. So I mean, this this is some of this is some of the complexity in there, uh, and also this geopolitical posturing, the fact that there's a new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope everyone checks out the fantastic report from April, Life or Debt, The Stranglehold of Neocolonialism in Africa's Search for Alternatives from the Tri-Continental Institute for Social Research, where you, Grieve Shelwa, are a senior fellow. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us some of your very precious time, I'm sure, here on the Freedom Side. Thanks, Eugene and Rania, for having me. Fantastic pleasure.